So, um, a little background on me. I uh, have been working for Nielsen for almost 20 years. Um, and my roles changed a little bit throughout that period. I initially started doing software testing um, and then started in a more developer role. Um, but we have kind of a, an odd take. It's sort of a cross between a statistician or um, a data person and a developer. Uh, so that's, that's the roles called a data developer. Um, so initially, you know, I've done a little bit of scripting in Python, and um, we had this this company goal to move off of SAS. If you know anything about SAS, it's a statistical um, package. It grew, it came from South Carolina, and there's actually a company, the SAS Institute, that um, sells the software, promotes it. They have big conferences every year, um, but it has a hefty license fee. And so Nielsen is looking for you know, free alternatives. We looked at some options, and Pandas and Python um, were natural fits. So um, I just started learning Pandas maybe a year ago. So I'm still fairly new newbie. Um, and uh, this, was, this talk was meant to just sort of be like a gentle introduction and maybe point out some common uh, pitfalls that, that you might experience as you start getting to learn Pandas. Um, so I'm using Jupyter Notebooks as Rich was doing in the last talk to <coughs> show off the code. Um, but uh, I didn't learn your name. Uh, when you talked about using it from a terminal, you know, you can write a Python script you know, in whatever editor you want and run it in a batch mode, you know, rather than interactively. The notebooks just make it nice because you can easily iterate through changes of code, see the output as you, you know, run a particular set. So as you're doing your initial development or data exploration, the notebooks are awesome. If you're doing something like turning that into a pipeline of data, where you want to do some kind of heavy duty ETL, you're going to want to turn them into to standalone scripts that you chain together with some kind of tool. But anyway, so um, Pandas is a Python library, uh, very closely related to NumPy. Um, the Pandas uses a lot of NumPy's types uh, under the hood. The thing that Pandas gives you um, that NumPy doesn't have is um, uh, mixed types. So NumPy, if you have a multi-dimensional array or a tensor, um, there it's going to be one type. It's going to be all floats, booleans, um, integers. With Pandas, you're able to deal with mixed data. So you can have strings, you can have floats, you can have integers, all mixed together um, in one table. So first thing I, I think of when I am dealing with like some new software, well, how do I get data into it? You know, what, what is my first step? So this first notebook here is how to read a delimited text file. Um, Often you'll see people doing two imports, an import of pandas and numpy, and typically numpy would be imported um, in this way. It's just a convention. These, these abbreviations, PD and NP, you'll see in a lot of examples if you, if you get there. So, um, reading from a delimited text file, this just happens to be some store fact data from my work. Um, you know, we have some IDs, some uh, sort names, addresses, et cetera, et cetera. So some of these are going to be um, text columns. Some of them are going to be float. Some of them are going to be integers. In this initial like step, all I did was call the pandas read CSV command. That returns a data frame. I passed in the 
file name, what the limiter the file has, and uh, we'll ignore this low memory equals false. It has to do with uh, the way that missing values are handled, uh, but not important. So I didn't, I didn't give Pandas any help, and it did its best to try to look at this file. If I open the actual text file, you'll see right away there's already a mistake. This ID is uh, it's got zero prefixes. It should be treated as a text problem if I don't want to, you know, lose lose that information. Um, it's a little harder as we like look over to the right and see this is actually the zip code column, and many zip codes start with zero. Let's look back to the notebook. You'll see, you know, it took its guess and it made this first column a number. It made the zip code a number and just eradicated the prefix zeros. So my, s oh, I wanted to demonstrate a little bit of uh, the, the fact that you can index by labels, which is different than numpy. So iloc is the function for indexing by, by position. Um, this head command that I, use in line three, this is just give me the first five, five rows and as many columns as it can comfortably display. Um, so handy if you're just browsing through the file trying to see what's there. If you don't know what's actually in the file, it might be that. Um, so then I sort of mimicked that with some of these uh, indexing commands. I'm trying to get just the first five rows and again, this is uh, Python style indexing, so even though it's zero to five, you want to get five values because it's an index that starts at zero. Um, and then just the very first column. So this, this first parameter in what looks like a list is the index, so the rows in this case, and the second one is the column. I only asked for one column. I could have supplied a list of columns and and gotten that, you know, got more than one column back. So now I've got column one and two. But I could also index by the label. I didn't tell Pandas what the labels were. It just picked them off of the first line of the file. There's so many options in read CSV that you can give hints to Canvas that you can um, you can really tune how it works. Um, it's it takes some time. Like I always have the documentation open on one side, one screen, and have it over. You know, have my where I'm doing my work in another window, just because there's so many, so many options, and I, I don't have the uh, the memory to keep that in mind. Not with how switching between um, different languages all the time. So, like I said, my first date, my first column has these prefix zeros. Um, in order to preserve those, I need to tell him what the column type is. If you do that using this D type. Uh, parameter. Pandas tries to be very Pythonic with its passing of uh, parameters into functions and things. So very often you'll see um, where there's key value pairs needed, you pass it in as a Python dictionary. Um, so that's what this syntax is. You say key type equals, and then the key is GTAP, the type is string. So now I've preserved my uh, prefix zeros. This file is maybe 200 megs on disk. So like the next pitfall that I want to point out is if your file 
file was relatively large. Um, and this by default just reads in the entire file. It's going to load it all into RAM, which is great um, for certain use cases. If you're doing analysis or whatever, you have plenty of RAM, you're not worried about stepping on, like, on a multi-user box, stepping on some other processes, those, then it's perfect. But if you do have an issue with uh, the size, you know, the memory that it's taking up, you can, the first way of handling that is by doing something called chunking. Um, so it sounds like, you know, you take off a chunk, you read that chunk, you process it, you write it out. So this is only useful if you don't need to do some kind of aggregation. Um, or you have multiple steps of that. So if you need to calculate a sum of the entire column in a data frame, this is not going to help you. You need to have multi steps in order to do that. Like you might be able to sum on your first pass through, sum all the chunks, and then sum the results of that. Um, but uh, if you're doing row by row processing, you know, chunking is, is very useful for keeping the memory usage. So there's a lot of code here in this line four that's dealing with the chunking, and I'll get back to that in just a second. But I wanted to point out that down down below here, where um, I'm printing out the memory usage for each of these chunks, and it's only 8,000 bytes rather than the how much it was used before. One because it's only, it's getting you the memory usage of that column, the GTID column, for that chunk. I've only, I've only said to use 100 rows for my chunk size. Um, it is, it does make the code a little bit more complicated. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're working within some limitation, you need, you need that complication. The other part of this code, besides just displaying that the memory usage is low, I, I wanted to show how to write out this chunk of data. Um, we read with read CSV, we write with two CSV. And there are very similar functions for like all kinds of formats. Um, things like parquet, feather, you know, relatively new formats that are often used in data lake facilities. Or computing uh, to HTML or whatever. So, so there's quite a lot of options there, but CSV is pretty basic. So, on my first iteration to the chunk, I do want to read the header, I want to write the header out, and on the second iteration through set header false in mode A for append. So I'm appending the same file. Um, in this case, I did something else just to do a little bit of useful work. Um, this, this file has a large number of columns. Let's say I wanted to only get a couple of columns. I just needed the AID and the name. So I've listed those, i put those in a list and supply that in this location function, that indexing. So I'm indexing by name, and supplying, um, obviously, the index, so I get all of those. And then just those fields that I want, GTAE and the name. I go look at the file. You'll see it's quite a bit smaller. It's only 13K. This issue of the prefix zeros, but this is Excel actually truncating those. They're, they're actually So that was one of the first uh, like gotchas or hurdles that I experienced with Andis is the fact that it just it reads the whole file of the memory. 
great when you're doing interactive stuff, but if you're doing batch processing, if you want to keep your users low, Dennis tends to uh, want to make copies of data frames as you do operations. Uh, so um, it's very easy if you have a gigabyte file, quickly run out of memory if you're not careful. Just reading through applying function and that function returns a, a data frame. So then you do something on that data frame and suddenly you've got 10 times the original file size. So for me, the, the chunking was uh, an important um, feature to format. Um, next, I wanted to talk about CAD and merging files. Um, so I have my original uh, store file. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. On your reduction in memory, was that, what the main cause of that due to the limiting of the fields, or was it another, I mean, I, I didn't pick up on the code, so. When, cause you eventually made a smaller file in the C, CSV, but, but you, you had a field uh, listing where you wanted certain, or you had a, a, you had a list of certain fields. Right, the file size was smaller because I only I limited the number of columns. Got I it. only selected those fields. But while it was running, while it was reading the data, and potentially you're you know, doing other steps besides just reading the file. And the data. If I were doing some heavy processing and I didn't want, uh, you know, a one gigabyte file that I made a copy of and another copy of. That's why I would use that chunk size. Um, that, that, I just thought the, the cause of the reduction was the elimination of fields, or was there something else? It, in, the, in the size of the text file, yes. But in the memory usage, it was using this chunk size parameter in read CSV. Okay. So I, I basically said, I want to process a thousand records at a time. Um, only reading that first thousand, give it to this, or store it in this DF chunk data frame, so a smaller data frame. I've only read the first thousand records my first time through here. Then, you know, I'm doing whatever processing I want to do. This is actually a for loop here, I didn't point that out, so perhaps that's why there's a little confusion. The first time through, I'm you know, DF chunk is the first thousand records. The second time through this for loop, DF chunk is the thousand one through two thousand. Right, 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 right. No, you back and back. Yep. But if you if you did a data frame elimination in Python, if you do data frame elimination of Python, it's also by just making DF equals the new fields. Would that cause the same thing to occur? Yeah, it would, it would be the same result in the file that you're output. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you do the read CSV without any sort of, of limiting of the columns or using a chunk size, it's going to read all that in memory for that step. Okay. So what you would want to do, if you wanted to eliminate eliminate the columns before doing any processing, you would want to say something like what I did in this. Uh, in this example, use calls is a parameter you can specify, you can give to read CSV. So before it tries to load this data into memory, it's going to look for the columns that it wants and then allocate the memory just for those columns. It's not going to, to load up the entire data frame just for you to then discard columns you didn't want. You're sort of discarding them as you're reading. I might get the, the gist, but I, I mean, I'm not a novice in this, but I know within within Pandas, you can also download the large file and cut it up just by, by uh, making a list and putting in the titles and the labels. So it'll create a whole new data frame for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, something, uh, something like uh, DF equals DF and then you double uh, make a, make a uh, you know, two brackets for a uh, 
Yeah, something like that, but just rename it DF. And you probably want, you know, the entire index, all rows, right, and just the columns. So you need, actually, you can just put, you can just put the uh, DF in, in double parentheses and put the name of the column you want. You can? Yep. Um, I'm not positive that still gives warnings. I well, it does feel like that yeah, okay. it might does be it. deprecated. You, you're correct, it does. But it's still better, I think, with it. Yeah. And then you can use iLock to do the, 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 the pat the chunk of the wall. I don't know if I need to specify the index in this style or not. Yeah, yeah, you almost have to. Uh, have a, just copy paste the index from something you had before, or the, the labels. If you had somehow either called them up before and you had a listing, you'd be able to just copy paste what you needed and throw it in. There. Bombs away. So yeah, this is only displaying the, the five rows, but it's the yeah, entire data frame. And I mean the interrupt your flow. I just, just as a quick question, I wanted to know what the that's fine. The chunk so. so there's two sort of similar operations in pandas: um, catenation and merge. This is another thing that I while I'm doing a lot of my job merging, you know, in this case, store data with the <coughs> state record that, um, that it corresponds to. Uh, <coughs> I'm trying to remember if it's, if you look at the documentation, concat um, is called the workhorse of, of doing merges. And I believe it is significantly faster than doing just the merge command. Uh, I don't have the timings. I need to, to um, put that together. But uh, um, you can merge on like the columns or on the rows of a data frame. Um, in this case, I'm going to merge the state name onto this uh, store record. So I've read in just the, the store fact file. It says state is the index. This is kind of the key. And then I've read in another file um, that has some Data information. State name abbreviation. The uh, column names don't match up. State brief is not the same as state. Um, and I want to make that the key, so I rename the column um, and then I set the index to state. And then I want to do my concatenation. I ran into an issue when I ran this. I made my join data frame. Concat is the command I'm talking about. Um, so I'm trying to join on axis one, which is the columns. I think I can also supply columns as the um, as a string here and what kind of join I want to do, um, inner versus outer. It did the join, but it didn't respect my index for some reason. I'm not sure if I ran things out of order. I tried restarting and running all the cells in the system. 
One thing is you run stuff in, in uh, Jupyter Notebook, you'll see as it's running, it gets like a little asterisk next to the cell. It may have completed already, so we're not going to see it. I think concatenation is uses. I'm just thinking that it might actually just use the index. So I'm not sure how. Um, this is just me, but usually can, I would think concatenation would use the index more so than actually that. I would agree with you, um, except I had an example of this work. Uh, I, I may have fallen prey to one of the pitfalls of Pandas, which is like not handling output. Um, a lot of the a lot of the functions uh, produce a data frame, and it's tricky because you're looking in a Jupyter notebook, you're seeing output, and maybe that looks like the output you want to see. Uh, but you haven't actually stored it anywhere. So, in this case, I may have set the index to state, but not actually use it, because basically it returned the result, it displayed it in the cell, um, but I didn't actually use the, the, data, the result that I wanted. So somehow my uh, my join is not working out, out properly. Um, one of the other things I wanted to, to point out with uh, a difference between pandas and numpy, which is probably important for um, machine learning and our AI work. Uh, pandas is very slow to do indexing. Um, But NumPy is, I shouldn't say very slow, it's fairly slow to do, to do indexing. NumPy is, is quite a bit faster. Since all of the data types are the same in the array, um, you, can, you can iterate through them much, much faster. So this, I found this example. Um, it's a comparison of, of the two, just getting a random choice of 10 elements from each of these series. And one is a, um, excuse me, a pandas data frame. I guess it's actually a series. And one is, is NumPy itself. Um, so one microsecond uh, for the, the NumPy version and 435 microseconds for the Pandas series. I haven't done a lot with, with NumPy, but we do have some heavy um, mathematical models and things that, that this has shown. I, I need to look into that in order to, to take advantage of that efficiency. Uh, But I suspect that, like doing machine learning, doing AI stuff, you're going to you're going to want to try to use NumPy arrays over Pandas when whenever performance is really going to count. Um, just consult my notes here. Talked about the operations making copies by default. Yes, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I don't have a like great conclusion here. Yeah, go ahead, Rich. I, I do have a question about, mm -hmm. so when you're taking your data and you're getting it into the Pandas data, in your production environment, the way you have it set up, 
Are you taking information and pulling it out of like a database and then dumping it into your pandas, doing operations, and then sending it back to a database? Like, where does this fit into an actual production environment in pandas and that process? Yeah, so uh, the way it fits in is um, we're not typically reading from a database, but uh, we have a, a data warehouse which is just files on disk. Um, we decided to go with text files, just for simplicity. Um, where we integrate like, a whole bunch of different data sources uh, from other parts of Nielsen, from customers. So often it gets down to we're delivered a text file. Um, it's not always delivered, sometimes uh, fixed with, but um, or we'll extract from from the database, and uh, like the kind of data that we deal with, we have store data, like what I showed you. Um, we have a proprietary trade area model that uh, gives, an, gives you an idea of who might be shopping at the store. It's based on the stores nearby, the amount of expenditures from people in that area, um, the road network, to see what stores people can read. <coughs> uh, we do with profile data, so surveys. Um, the Nielsen uh, home scan survey, where people like scan the products that they've bought. Uh, actually, I think there's an app now. They don't have. They don't send out the barcode scanners anymore. Um, but people like sign up to become a home scan survey participant, and then you know, track all their purchases um, for consumer shop, consumer package goods. And uh, we get the result of that data, you know, with privacy um, kept in mind, like we don't have names or anything like that. It's all demographics um, of the households, but not any personally identifiable information. But then we, so we take that, we have a bunch of, um, Models and um, the processes that we run things through to kind of tell a story of who's shopping at a particular store, like the demographics of that person, what kind of products they might be um, also interested in. <coughs> if they bought Cheetos, are they also going to buy Lay's or some other some other brand of snack food, or are they going to? be interested in, you know, some media. Like, do they watch a particular show? Do they uh, read a particular magazine? And all of that then, once we, you know, once we basically built our data warehouse with all, all of these points of data, um, we load it into an Oracle database uh, that's, that our web application like reads from and allows clients of Nielsen to like go in and, and run reports and say, okay, I'm interested in this store, or I'm interested in this particular product. Or that kind of thing. And we also were now fulfilling into like a Nielsen global uh, data lake, um, which again is, is we're supplying text files and we're getting ingested into um, Azure. So we call an API, we um, upload the files to a staging area, and call this API, and it registers a whole bunch of metadata about columns and, and fields, and then uh, makes it available for you know, the larger Nielsen. Does, um, does Pandas help? So, you were talking that it eventually goes into like an Oracle database. Does does Pandas help with like an ORM, or do you have to like manually make that that ORM takes it into like a database? Uh, I don't think Pandas has any like built-in ORM, but you can use like Python's. Uh, like on the package name, um, 
Sequel of Alchemy? Yes, Sequel of Alchemy. That's it. Um, to, to do that kind of thing. We currently aren't using that. Um, we have like a custom built engine that does additional transformations from what we store in our warehouse to make um, like batch loaded files for Oracle. Because we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of millions of rows and we we don't do it on an ongoing basis, it's it's uh, periodic. So we do these loads and then we do like a database swap. Um, so there's a, a, a lot of prep and then boom, then it goes live. Uh, mm. Also one thing about the NumPy that I it's more like a lower level from at least from what I've seen it's more like a lower level like almost like a seal right where pandas from what I've seen pandas is more like an excel table or like a whole table like of different values where numpy is very strict because it's pretty much a seal right yeah from what I've read pandas does use NumPy arrays when possible, and it's just when um, there. I think there's just like a little bit of there's some overhead built in that pandas is is slowing that down a little bit when you're doing like this indexing, for example. If you're doing operations where you're where you're dealing with a whole data frame, you. If you want to do that within pandas, you want to use something like the apply function, where it can deal with an entire column at once. So I, I'm trying to recall. I believe the data is stored in a way that's column-wise efficient. So when you, you want to do things um, not by indexing over the array, but by saying, here, deal with this entire matrix, this entire data frame at once, do the sum of this data frame and another data frame, and it'll be way more efficient than trying to iterate over, over the data frame. Um, a trick I, oh, I'm not on Wi-Fi. There's, there's a trick I found. Uh, so we have this, um, what we call framework. So it's, Think of it as like an Excel uh, table where the columns are um, one dimension. What, what you're counting is households, okay? One, one dimension, the columns are like a lifestyle. Um, so urbanicity and, and income. And then the rows are uh, household size and, and age and presence of kids. So you've got like this multi-dimensional array. If you summed up all the cells, you get like the total households in that area, let's say in the state. Um, you, you can define multi-indexes in Pandas, and you, there's, there's a trick you can do to use the same label on multiple columns and then do a group by. That's another relatively fast thing in Pandas. Um, in order to take, like I had the, I'm trying to remember the original size of the array. It was like all the age groups from zero to 99, where 99 is 99 above. Um, and then and Actually, I'm thinking of a different array. Uh, it was like, it's like age by gender by um, household type, whether it's group quarters or, or in, a, in a household. Um, and I found that by grouping by like labels, like if, if I label, um, if I wanted to make groups of the ages, so 0 to 5, 6 to 10, etc., 
instead of trying to iterate over those or, or have a lot of hard-coded um, logic, I could duplicate the labels and label the first five rows um, all 0 to 5, age 0 to 5, and then the next five rows, age 6 to 10, and then do the group by in one operation and collapse all of those cells. So I'm, I'm grouping by the, the label and then doing the sum. And it, it just, like I said, it, I call this so a trick more, just because it was. The more like complex stuff is faster. In short, the more complex stuff is usually quicker. Versus right, you, you need to look at like what functions are available and not treat them like arrays. Is, I guess the short version of, of my advice. If you're trying to do things in pandas, if, if you can go to NumPy, if you've got like all the same kind of data, um, maybe the iteration is, is even faster than doing that kind of thing in pandas. That would be some, something worth uh, you know, a stress test. But, uh, any other questions? Okay. Thanks, everyone.